You're listening to The Support Report with Be Present, where we share real stories from young adults and how support changed their lives. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of The Support Report. We are Be Present. I'm your host, Justin Peters, and joined, as always, by Kiara Riga. Kiara, how are you? I'm not bad. How are you, Justin? I'm doing great. I I think we both shared a couple of updates uh, last conversation. I'm finally moved in the house. You see, I got some decorations in the background now. Give me the update, the quick update on the wedding planning. Any big decisions that have been made recently? Um, Well, we toured the venue this weekend. They put in, um, like, this is our second tour. They put in wood flooring where there used to be carpet. So we're very excited. I also, for anyone who's listening, like, not on YouTube, Justin has the most incredible Bulbasaur planter (laughs) behind him. That's got like plants coming out of it like a Bulbasaur. If you're not a Pokemon fan, you probably don't know what I'm talking about, but it's really incredible. All right. Let me let me bring Bulbasaur a little bit closer into the shot today. So if you're on bring YouTube right now <laughs> <laughs> and I'll push him back back here. But but yes, he's he brings me a lot of joy. So I bring him into the, the set design for this. <laughs> Love it. So, okay, carpet to hardwood. Sounds like you kind of get excited about some of the the old timey things. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, it's just a really cool, like we're getting married at a marine research lab that like so they're, sick. yeah, and it's like their kind of education wing where, you know, kids can come and learn. So when we toured it this weekend, we got to touch sharks like it was great. I mean, little ones, little okay. guys, but still <laughs> so cool. Like I just, I really, we are going so non-traditional and I'm having a lot of fun with it. I feel like that's your life. You're just the non-traditional and every, every definition of that, that's, that's Kiara to a T. And speaking yeah, of non- I, I would agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of non-traditional, uh, what about Matthew, our friend that we got on the call today? You want to give him a, a little bit of an intro here? <laughs> I got him laughing on the call this year. (laughs) I am so excited for you guys all to meet Matthew. Matthew was diagnosed with metastatic pancreatic cancer at 32 years old, and he's currently celebrating two years without evidence of recurrent metastatic disease. So Matthew, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for being here. Matthew, kick us off, man. Um, You, a couple of words that are thrown out there that we don't... pancreatic cancer and we mostly always speak to to young adults and talk about their journey with cancer i'm not sure we've covered this cancer before and i'm guessing this isn't necessarily a cancer that many young adults are typically worried about what's the give me some stats i know you were sharing some things and then let's start walking through your cancer journey well Gosh, I'll start with this. The pancreas is a six inch organ somewhere in your gut, closer to your spine, probably than to the front of your gut behind your stomach. The ancients had a word for it, as they had so many words for so many things. Uh, ultimately, their their words, you know, referred to understandings that were irrelevant. And we the, we spent the better part of 2,000 years ignoring what a pancreas was, what it did, what it really was for. And it turns out that, like, one of the most deadly cancers you can have, like, like the big daddy of cancers, the ones where it's like, okay, well, like, you know, There's plausible deniability in a lot of sense. Like you can, or not even, pardon me, not plausible deniability, but you can be like, oh, I can beat this. I can do this. And the narrative around pancreatic cancer is like, well, well, hold on. No, you can't. That's, (laughs) just slow down, sit down. Please, grandpa, sit down. You're you're exerting yourself and you're making everyone very nervous. Uh, It's a very, very difficult cancer uh, to beat, and it doesn't often affect people uh, who are our age. Um, I was saying before that if you are under the age of 35, it's like 0.36 per 100,000 people. Uh, It's it is it's hilariously low. It's so it's so low 
but but it's also not impossible. Um, <laughs> there are a lot of us. There are enough of us for me to be annoying about it. Um, <laughs> well, let's be annoying about it in today's conversation. Oh, let's let's wow. get into it. Uh, I'm stoked. So, 32 years old, you get diagnosed with this cancer that is the granddaddy of cancers. You're given, I don't know, like one to three years of like quote, quote, good years remaining in your life. But here I am talking to you. You look like you're fine, healthy, excited about what's going on in your life. And it's four, what, four plus years or going on almost four years since that it diagnosis? Will be two years. Yeah, we're multiple. We're, I'm, I'm past my, I'm past my expiration date <laughs> at, at the very least. Gosh, I, I, th this entire thing started when I, when, you know, during COVID, um, I was teaching at a university, I'm an academic, or I used to be an academic, and I lost my position, dur you know, like a lot of, you know, young career academics did, and I moved to North Carolina to friend, to, to help a friend with his business, and the business goes under like so many do during COVID. And he and his family, they moved to Maine. And I'm in a, you know, a new city. I don't know anyone there. And I am diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. It's a, about a five month journey between when I start experiencing symptoms. It's a very scary thing to be confronted with because even though I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease as a 25 year old, when your, when your poop turns poop, I thought about this, which word I would use all day. Poop's but a I, good I one. I like poop. it. Yeah. Uh, when your, your poop turns bone white Ugh. and your skin becomes really itchy and your urine becomes really dark, um, and you haven't, you know, you haven't consumed as much liquor as would uh, result in that, right? Like, you haven't lived a totally irresponsible lifestyle. It's very scary. It's very scary to be 30-something and be, and not like, and not, not to denigrate the experience of other people with cancer. My mother died of breast cancer. So to find a lump is no small thing. But there is, I think, a difference between finding a lump and one day waking up and your skin is alive in furious itching and you're shitting bone white and you're pissing <laughs> like the color of coffee. And like that's, 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 it's at least qualitatively different. It's, it's jarring. I don't mean that it's more jarring, but it's certainly differently jarring um and and being in your you know early 30s you're not set up for you're not set up for my skin is going to furiously itch my eyes will turn yellow did did you set up a an appointment with your doctor like immediately Almost. or did you try to be like mm, what's happening uh, here okay <laughs> so i was in a long distance relationship and um you know, I was alone in Durham and I let this go for two days yeah. before I told someone. And if you are out there and you feel like you've done the wrong, you've, you haven't, you know, it, when, when you come to it is, is fine. Yeah. Um, it took me about two days without sleep. The itching was so horrible that I could not alleviate the feeling in my hands or my feet. So I would turn the, the, the tub on as hot as it would go. And I would force myself to hold my hands and feet under there oh. until the flesh was so scalded that I couldn't feel it anymore. Um, yes. It's horrible. It's horrible. Um, I, I just, I didn't know what was happening to me. Yeah. Um, and you know, eventually, I, three, four days, um, I broke down, I told someone, and that got my medical journey started. Um, for those of you at home, pancreatic cancer mostly affects people over the age of 70. 
So to be 32 and to have it is is incredibly rare. And so when I got to the hospital, when I finally broke down and went to the hospital, that was not. Even when they found a stricture in my bile duct, and for those of you at home, your liver creates bile. It is a digestive enzyme. It goes through your uh, common bile duct into your gallbladder. Your gallbladder stores it. And then when you eat chicken wings or chicken fingers or whatever, something high in fat, your gallbladder deposits um, bile into your duodenum, into a part of your small intestine to digest food. That process takes it through the head of your pancreas. If there's a little tumor on the head of your pancreas, squeezes that little bit off um, and you, your body redeposits uh, uh, bile inside of your flesh. Mm. And that can uh, result in uncomfortable itching. Even if it doesn't, you're going to look yellow and weird to people um, and someone will tell you. Yeah, that's totally fair. Here, I don't even know if I know your kind of first few days symptom to to doctor. What's what's that story? I don't know if we talked about Yeah, it's about actually, I don't know that I've ever talked about this publicly, if I'm being honest, but um, I had breast, can- I have breast cancer, like your mom. Um, and I, when I found the lump, I was like watching TV and I dropped the remote on my chest. I was like watching in bed and I dropped it on my chest. And when I went to pick it up, I was like, oh, that's not normal. Um, right. And found the lump. And I was, I just remember going like white, you know, that feeling of like all blood leaving your face. And it was like on some level, I think I knew, but it definitely took me at least a week to make that appointment. And it's different. Like, like you say, Matthew, it's so different when it's just a lump. And I, I think one of the harder things for me with treatment is like, I felt better before I started treatment versus you're dealing with something where immediately you are feeling terrible. And so for me, it was like, okay, well, I can see if it changes. I can see if it gets better. Like maybe I'm just overreacting. And then, you know, the whole misdiagnosis situation kind of happened for like a year, but it's scary when you figure it out. And I think, you know, on some, like, I think your body knows before your brain does and like is trying to tell you things. Um, because I knew in the second that I found it, but I didn't want to believe it. And Kiara, thank you so much for sharing that. Who was the first phone call that you made to who, who maybe not convinced you, but made you aware to like go book an appointment? Was that your long distance relationship? It was, um, she and I went to graduate school together at the university of Kentucky and she said, I needed to go to the hospital I went to the hospital, you know, I didn't have a a doctor in town. I had just, I'd been in Durham for two months and um, she sent me, she was like, you got to go. I went to a, a, not a walk-in, an urgent care. Yeah. And it was, uh, you know, the feedback was kind of limited. It was like, oh, well, your enzymes are really elevated do you have a really intense drinking problem and eventually we got past that and they were just like well you're new here you don't have a doctor you should go to the hospital um and so the next morning i did another evening of incredibly itchy skin and reported to uh duke hospital in durham north carolina the next morning Um, And that is really where the journey began. Um, They did an ultrasound of my body, found a stricture uh, tightening of my bile duct. They were like, well, you have Crohn's disease and, you know, it could just be inflammation. We'll put a stent in there to so your bile can flow regularly And then in two weeks, we'll take it out. And that should have stretched it out. 
And I don't know if y'all have ever been to a doctor and had them say something to you that was just so totally stupid that you were like, okay, well, is that is that real? To stretch it out? Like, yo, why was it in need of stretching to begin with? We didn't get there at that point. Um, <laughs> uh, they put the stent in. Two weeks later, they took the stent out. My symptoms, the itchy skin, the yellow eyes, the white shit, that all came back. And they were like, oh, well, we need to take your gallbladder out. Which, if you are under 45 and diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, they will almost certainly try to do. And oftentimes... Like, when you have those symptoms and they take your gallbladder out, that, like, that's the net, that's, that's what needs to happen. That was not true in my case. Two weeks, three weeks after, uh, I, uh, they took my gallbladder out, the symptoms came back, I went to my, uh, I'm sure you, you have all heard this story by now, but I went back to my GI, at a very, 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 fa a very fancy GI at a very fancy hospital. And that person told me, well, honey, I this is how she said it. You definitely don't have cancer. You for sure don't have cancer. If you have cancer, I will roll over in my grave. And then two hours later, two hours, I get a fucking uh, uh, a notification on my phone that says adenocarcinoma. And I didn't know what that word meant, so I looked it up. And But you know, right? You know a little bit. You know, uh, the way I've described it to people is that, that cancer words sound like Star Wars words. Mm -hmm. So adenocarcinoma, sarcoma, like you don't know. They, they could be good. They're probably not good. Like we've seen enough Star Wars to know these are not good words. Um, two hours after that, um, my uh, the surgeon who happened to have taken my gallbladder out turned out to be one of those hotshot surgeons that, I don't know if you watch Grey's Anatomy, this is how most people know about pancreatic cancer. There's like one episode of The Golden Girls and like 11 episodes of Grey's Anatomy. Um, so uh, the guy who happened to take out my gallbladder, he was the hot, he was McDreamy. <laughs> He actually kind of is, yo. He's like, he's like six foot four. He's got broad shoulders. He looks, you're, you're, y'all are younger for this. But if your dad really liked Star Trek, uh, Star Trek, Superman in the 80s, my surgeon looks like Superman from the 80s. <laughs> Matthew, I, I do want to talk a little bit about your support system because I'm very curious what that looked like. Um, I think that's an important thing to talk about. It, it's definitely an important piece. And I know you've hinted at a few different people. You were kind of alone in North Carolina by yourself. So curious yeah. to figure out what happened here. I know one friend in particular, maybe Alex is his name, uh, might have came to, to the rescue. I'd love to hear a little bit about yeah. Alex and the rest of your support system. My best friend, Alexander, and I grew up in South Florida. Um. And it's weird now because on the other end of this, there are hurt feelings on bo both sides. And we haven't, uh, we haven't spoken in a long time. So um, I will not give you the, the funny Matt Rosenblum answer, but I will give you the, Alex did an incredibly generous thing for me. Mm. And as soon as I was diagnosed, he was living in uh, Dakar, Senegal at the time in West Africa. Alex works in uh, development aid and digital cartography. And... About two months later, he moved back to the United States with his then, well, his then girlfriend and now wife. Um, and they moved back to Durham to see me off into death. Mm. Um, and they did 
an incredibly generous thing. Um, the only thing I would say, and I, having been, uh, uh, when you are very sick and you're young and you have a kind of cancer that a lot of people don't have, and you have my personality, you can be a little bit of elbows. Um, and I really, I don't mean that. I don't mean to be that way. For the what most you, part, wait, what I do you saw. Mean, what do you mean by elbows? I think I am read often as a little aggressive, as um, as ungrateful sometimes, and I think part of that is a toxic narrative surrounding cancer. You know, cancer survivorship and care. Um, so I will say it this way that. <laughs> I don't know that I would be alive today without Alex and his wife and without the tremendous number of people surrounding me who made me go through it because I don't think I would have done it. Mm. But when you're in this situation, I think it is important to remember that the person you're caring for, that the person you're dealing with is a human being. Mm -hmm that they are still an agent, that they are still a man or a woman. And I say it like that because the patient becomes, you know, you're so old, you're so sick, your proximity to death is so close that the assumption is that you do not, you no longer have direct access to your own mind, mm -hmm. that there is a way that you are tacitly marginalized mm. and that both institutionally and interpersonally I think is the greatest toxic formation in the caretaker survivor caretaker patient organization foundation patient relationship yeah that they're the caretaker, in my case, assumed a, a tremendous amount of responsibility. My best friend saddled the world on his shoulders, but he did not think to, to, to ask me a question, to, to call me on the phone. I got told that he was moving to Durham, that it was something that was happening whether I wanted it or not. Mm. Um, and so, like, I don't, gosh, I love him for doing it. I don't know that I would be alive without it. Yeah. But I resent the, I resent the implication that I don't deserve an explanation and I don't deserve to be asked. And I think that that is something that happens more often than we are willing to admit. I, I do appreciate the the honesty and the transparency and the vulnerability, Matthew. I think that's actually really hard to speak about um, and honestly speak that. about. You didn't sugarcoat that a whole lot. You spoke that through your own perspective, but you're also self-aware enough to know and understand some of the perspectives and experience of other people. And that's really challenging and definitely something that I think is much needed in conversation and a reason why we love this podcast and this organization because us as supporters, we don't know, like we can't there. We will never, never be able to actually feel what you were and still feel to this day. So I think that's really hard. I, I mean, Kiara is the, my best lifeline on some of this stuff. And, and I know she's said many of the same things in in a lot of our conversations as well. Well, and I want to validate to what you said. I haven't had that experience to that degree with caregivers, but I think like going through cancer just in general, you lose agency over your own body to a degree that I don't think anyone is really able to understand until they go through it. All of a sudden, it's not choosing between like, oh, I'll do, you know, 
like think about when you're choosing medication for birth control it's like do i want the pill or the the implant or do i want to use barrier methods i don't know why this is the first thing that came into my brain but no, I, it you makes know, sense that it's you've, the... you've got like options and there's different yeah. side effects with each options and you can choose different ones and at the end of the day if those don't work for you okay well we're gonna you know we'll find something else that doesn't include hormones or whatever but when you're going through cancer, like right now, I'm having a very difficult time on my treatment and we're trying to decide a new one. But every option, it's either death, it is violently shitting your pants constantly, <laughs> it's horrific nausea, it is, um, you know, hand and foot syndrome. Most people don't even know what that is, right? And so people don't understand like how little control you all of a sudden don't have in your life. And on the healthcare side of it, that's for good reason, right? That is to help you survive and live the best life you can for as long as possible. But when it comes to the caregiver side and your life outside of healthcare, I find myself trying so much more to just control what I can, have a say in things, have my voice be heard, because in other parts of my life, I've had that taken away to such a degree that, like, I just need that elsewhere. And the reality is nobody has control of anything except for our own actions. But at the end of the day, I think when you're thinking about supporting someone, that's a really, really important thing to remember. I mean, I think we always talk about, you know, nobody wants to like, let me know if you need anything. But I think just like one of the best, um, one of the best like examples of support that I've seen is someone sending her friend a text saying, hey, I want to help you. I can A, go to the grocery store and refill anything you need. B, take your kid's for a day so that you can relax by yourself. C, um, clean your house while you relax, you know, and just list off, here's all of the things that I'm able to do. What is most beneficial to you, right? And that's a way that you are able to show up, you are able to like give support and also give agency to that person. Because even if it just like, just any form of control feels so good when we're so out of control. Well, Matthew, it's been a pleasure. Um... Where can people stay connected with you? Are you active on social media? Are you promoting anything in particular right now? So um, I am active on social media. You can find me at Ugh My Pancreas on Instagram. U G H my U G H M Y P A N C R E A S. Gary, you want to bring us home? Absolutely. Thank you all so much for listening to another episode of the Support Report with Be Present. I'm Kiara Riga, joined by my co-host Justin Peters and our wonderful guest Matthew. And we hope you'll join us for the next episode.